on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. It's always been my own personal pain point of having to jump from program to program, from file to file, and I've just kind of always wished there was something that could do this. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is Friday and therefore it is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. You glitched when you said that. You glitched last week when you said that. And the editor asked me if I had any other recordings of you, and I looked, and you glitched on that. So I think you're glitching. Oh, it's possible. I don't know. Maybe I've, are you, are I, you, I mean, a... you, I mean, physically, you. I think mean, you are. Oh, because you're well, more machine than man now. We know. Matrix but... is coming out, isn't it? Soon, so it's. Uh, I'm actually. Uh, never seen the Matrix. Neo. <laughs> oh, you've never seen the Matrix. Then. Never right. seen the Matrix. Is that? No. Right. Um, right. What we're going to talk about? I was going to say something. Oh, yes. Do you know where we should be? We should be eating chips and fish and... Fries. Chips. Fries. Fries and fish and drinking beer with our friends in 85 to 90 degree warm weather Mm. standing on the beach in Florida. But instead, because of of a virus, the virus, we're here. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm not thrilled, I have to say. I've seen the pictures on Facebook from Dan Wood and um, Cecilia, been on in Nathan's plane, and um, Lucy. Lucy, Lucy Squall, I've seen. Do you know, sh- shout out to Cecilia, because she is, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this publicly, but she is frightened of flying. She's genuinely scared of flying. So I've tried to arrange stuff with Cecilia before, and she said, well, I don't want to take another flight because I'm scared of flying. So, uh, But she went up in a small aircraft with Nathan I think yesterday. she piloted it. He, he let yeah. her uh, take the controls as well, which is... Uh, I mean, I haven't heard break. from them since, but, you know, I'm sure no. it's full fun. <laughs> no, I've, I've seen, um, yeah, seen some lovely pictures. And also, we sponsored um, uh, one of the uh, the kind of welcome meal drinks, I suppose. Welcome reception, um, yeah. <clears throat> and so I've seen some pictures of our kind of uh, little flags on the tables and things, uh, which was, on the one hand, very nice, and on the other hand, quite annoying, because I would... <laughs> quite like to have been there yes but there we so go. if you don't know what we're talking about we're talking about nink novelist incorporated we have an annual conference in uh well it's been in florida for the last few years i think it was chicago before it was something like that um and it's a conference aimed at people who are currently selling books or writing and marketing and selling books that are either traditionally published or or indie so it's a step up from the absolute beginners um and it's been very very good over the years it's a really really fun place to go it's a nice place to go anyway um but to network to meet people we've met some friends who we've been dealing with online in person and learned loads of stuff we found people like becca sign teaching a really brilliant course there and, and others and we've taught you've lectured to a room full of people in your lecturing kind of way um but yes uh, because of obviously the global pandemic second year of that we've missed it um we are hoping there has been an announcement surprise announcement from the white house that they are opening up um, they're sort of moving into the more European style of saying, as long as you're double vaccinated and you've had a test before, you can come in and do business in our country. So we are, fingers crossed, hoping that's going to happen in time for us to fly to Vegas on something like the 6th of November for the 20 Books to 50K conference uh, organised by uh, Michael Andelay and Craig Martell. I should say organised by Craig Martell. Michael Andelay turns up and stands on stage and says, well done, Craig. But um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so we're hoping that's going to happen. And it'd be lovely because I know a lot of people listening to the show will be trying to get there as we are. Yeah, fingers crossed. There's not much we can do apart from we've got our flights booked, hotels are booked. Um, and we'll, uh, you know, we know what we're going to talk about on stage. Um, so we'll, we'll get that ready. And it is just a question of um, being allowed in. Uh, the alternative, of course, we... Um, we go to Mexico for a couple of weeks and then um, stick yeah. over the border there. <laughs> Which doesn't sound much like we're um, drug running, does it? No. Was that was that a slur? You you slagged off one of us slagged off Florida last time, and I can't remember whether it was you or me. No, no, it was. I think um, it was you. We didn't slag. It was me. We didn't slag it off. We just we we'd merely pointed out that uh, the COVID rates in Cor- in Florida were quite high that week. Yes, and, and I think uh, I think you used it a, a, an expression that may have 
triggered some people. And uh, I've just described, uh, I've no. just slurred Mexico as being a drug running place, but um, it's a beautiful country. And actually quite a few authors live down there. Places, what's that place? Santa Maria. Come, no, not, oh yeah, Cabo, of course. Yeah, that's the big retiree zone. But there's somewhere I think Steve Moore, your old school chum lives. It's that's quite right. a creative kind of yeah, hub. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, can't remember his name. Mm, Alta Maria or something like that, anyway. Uh, Anyway, lovely Mexico, I'm sure, and uh, let's be friendly and nice. Now, one thing we do have to mention, it is time for us to open the doors on our self-publishing 101 course. That's going to happen on Wednesday, the 6th of October. Uh, it is an opportunity for you to uh, use the teachings that Mark and I and a host of, uh, of other experts put together for you. What does 101 do, Mark? What does 101 do? Well, it's the uh, foundation, really. So it's everything you need to know from the moment you have finished your um, your book, or you know, even if you've got a few books and you you haven't really got things going yet, it will show you the, the the steps you need to put in place to give yourself the best shot to to sell lots of books and find readers. So you know, it's it's the kind of the beginner to intermediate course, and the intention is that the ads course fits in together with that quite nicely. But I wouldn't recommend people start running ads unless everything is optimized. Um, perfectly so that uh, those ads can can do their, their best job for you and that's that's what 101 is intended to do yeah i mean in running fuse books i found 101 immensely useful um particularly understanding things like the cover and blurb understanding not just where it's got to go and technically how to get it there but understanding its role in selling your book this is not simply um you know, a lesson we do cover the basics of how to set up an account and so on, but it's why you're doing things and how to make it optimal. And uh, the sort of Dawson approach is that you you do everything to make sure that your product is indistinguishable from something from Faber and Faber or Random Public House, or Random Penguin House, whatever they're called, Random House Penguin, whatever they're called. Um, <laughs> penguin they're Random be, House. Yes, I know where Random, that comes from. Random Penguin House. That By sounds the time like this, you get this... at the zoo. You go, <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the Random Penguin House. <laughs> Random Penguin. I wonder if we could get away with calling a publishing company Random Penguin. There'll all be one company by the time this podcast goes out. Um, anyway, uh, yes, it's incredibly useful. It has been the course that has just ignited so many author careers, and we are always delighted and pleased. We have a whole page full of uh, authors waxing lyrical about the 101 course, so it's our course, and we're proud of it. And uh, nothing cheers us more than meeting somebody who wants to shake our hand and say, you unlocked it for me. Um, so that's available if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. And that will be from Wednesday the 6th, probably open at 10 p.m. UK time. So that's a bit earlier in the day uh, in America and a bit later the next day in, um, or early the next day in Australia. Good. Um, so a couple of other things. What else are we going to talk about? Let's talk about TikTok. So TikTok is is a platform that's, we, we mentioned it, a couple of weeks ago because we had an interview of course with Leela and Jane and uh, it's a platform that's very much caught our eye um, much more than Instagram did much more than Twitter has done it's caught our eye because authors are filling up the space and hashtag book talk which is kind of a sub strata of of TikTok and they are reporting uh, great guns they're reporting uh, genuinely uplift in their careers as a result of this and so We've been digging down into it. We've had a lot of discussions with Leela and Jane who do a fantastic job in uh, not just evangelizing TikTok for authors, but in teaching how to do it, how to get it right. Very much we felt in the mold of how you teach in your expert areas, Mark. And so I'm delighted to announce that Leela and Jane have signed with us. They have joined the self-publishing formula family and they are currently working on a module, a very comprehensive module. It'll be something uh, that will once applied will help you move the needle on your books and that for that reason it's going to go into ads for authors so uh, they're working on it now it's going to be released in january next year uh, if you are already a student of ads for authors you will get it at no extra cost of course because that's how we operate uh, and if you're getting into ads for authors for the first time it'll be open for enrollment in january uh, get in now because everything in the future including this tiktok module is part and parcel of that uh, we're very excited about it we're going to build up towards that mark uh, uh, we had a technical problem with the last webinar replay i know lots of you missed it so we're going to do another webinar on tiktok that will be closer to uh, probably in january as well because they're 
obviously um, Leela and Jane are very busy in the immediate future and we're going to put our heads together and come up with some other training ideas for TikTok so the best place to be I guess is in the Facebook group Mark for this yeah to start with well if, of course if you're on the the mailing list uh, you'll get notification when we have something um, more concrete to say but yeah we've got a few things um, that we think might be quite fun next year yeah, and it's one we're going to have to keep on top of because it's going to be a fast-changing platform, I think. It's obviously in its infancy compared to some of the other social media platforms, and it will evolve and change, and uh, we will make sure that it's something that we uh, we keep at all our courses. We keep dynamic, right? They keep. To, we've been changing this week, actually, and making some changes to the uh, 101 course to, to make sure it's absolutely bang up to date. Good. Now, talking of new things, we have Dave Chesson on today's podcast. Um, welcome back to Dave. It's been a little while since we've had Dave on. If you don't know who he is, he's based in Nashville in the US, and he is the man behind a product called Publisher Rocket. And Publisher Rocket is really your metadata friend. So when you talk about keywords and categories, uh, Publisher Rocket is, I think in many people's eyes, an essential tool for indie authors. In fact, it should be an essential tool for probably traditional published um, marketing organizations as well. Whether they use it or not, I don't know. But there's gold dust in there, Mark, isn't there? We should, you know, because we're talking about something else mainly in the interview, it's worth just talking about Publisher Rocket for a second. In not just helping you select your, your categories, but you understanding how particular genres perform, whether you're writing in a genre that's got lots of readers and not much supply, which is ideal, or whether you're writing in a genre that's oversupplied by by books um, with not as many readers. I mean, that's it's it's the type of marketing research that's available because of big data today that simply wasn't available in the past. And it's it is important. Yeah, so it's uh, it is a, it's a useful product. He's he's been around for a while, um, so it's fairly well established now. Most authors probably have heard of it. Um, I think it's pretty reasonably priced, um, and it uh, th there's you know there's there have been tools like this available for other Amazon sellers for a long time. So something like Merchant Words is a very well established um, tool that does a similar function for people who are selling stuff that they've bought in China and reselling into the uh, domestic markets. Uh, you can use those tools for books, but they're not ideally they're not they're not looking at books specifically, which is what Publisher Rocket does. Um, so yeah, Dave's Dave's got a good grasp of, of that. He's um he's got a good team of, of developers who help him with that and, and he's he's then added to his portfolio with um with Atticus, which given that I have a character called Atticus, I sometimes get a bit confused when people say, How's how how are you finding Atticus? And I'm like, Well, yeah. it's all right, you know, selling quite <laughs> yeah. a few copies, but um yeah, so it's uh it's a it's a nice product. Um, I know you'll speak with, with him and you've mentioned that they had some teething problems in the early days and um, it's always the case with, you know, we've seen it too, um, with, with digital products, you occasionally get things that go wrong and, and you, but the, then you can get, you know, get them fixed. And I know Dave is very responsive and his team is very responsive to um, uh, the issues that only really get discovered when people start using something in a, in a good yeah. number. Uh, you don't necessarily see those when you're testing yourself. Well, if an organization with a market value of Apple can release a, a phone that has problems on day one, uh, that just goes to show that it's a fraught area of very complex things, digital tools. And as you say, once they're used in anger, things things turn up. And I think he was a victim of his own success. I think it was a massive scramble for those beta slots. Yes, and they were, it he was. was a bit overwhelmed yeah. in those first few days. Okay, look, that's enough from us. Let's hand over to, to me. Uh, for a couple of days ago when I interviewed Dave Chesson, we'll talk Atticus and Publisher Rocket and everything else. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Dave Chesson, welcome back to the Self Publishing Show. It's been a long time, I think, since you've been on the show. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> I think you were definitely one of the first guests because you're such a huge star in the indie world. You're like a pillar. Oh. A pillar, I was going to say. Oh, well, thank you. That really means a lot coming from you guys. So, And uh, it's been fun uh, working with you on and off over the years and hanging out together, which this time of year we would normally be doing, but because of this, this blooming pandemic it doesn't seem to want to go away. This is Man. the closest we're going to get, Dave. Hey, at least we got this. <laughs> We've got this. And at least I don't have to make uh, excuses as to why I don't want to drink whiskey, which you're always handing me and saying, <laughs> smell this, James, and drink this. And I have to go, oh, that's nice. And to do it that way, because I just, uh, I'm a beer guy. I just, uh, I can't, I don't want to waste all my alcohol units on tiny bits of alcohol. But you love it. I had a couple it. of bourbons I was looking to share with you this time, but and, next uh, year. 
I've given it away now, what I do with them. I know you love your bourbon. Um, okay, look, we're going to talk uh, all things that are happening at your end, especially Atticus, which is a really exciting, could be a huge product that we're all very familiar with in a few years. I know that's your aim, and it's um, it, we're going to hit all about it on this show. At the time this podcast is going out, it should be the 1st of October. It should be widely available, publicly available. That's correct. Yep. Well, that's very exciting. I know there's been a private beat and a few people listening will have been involved in that. But why don't we start with Atticus? Why don't you explain to us what Atticus is? Well, when Atticus comes out, uh, what it will be is basically Vellum, but cheaper and works on all platforms. See, Vellum created a phenomenal way to format books. You have the ability to see what your book looks like as you format it. It's very simple, intuitive. But the problem is, is that, well, one, it's really expensive because let's face it, it was the only cat in town. Uh, and two, it's only for Mac. And so a lot of authors who use PC would either have to uh, use Mac and cloud or for many, uh, they actually buy a Macintosh computer just to be able to use the one program. And so we decided uh, not only to create a formatting tool that works on all platforms, and that includes Linux to uh, Mac, PC, uh, even Chromebook, Android, uh, all of those. But we want to go a step further. My absolute goal is kind, kind of summed up in a statement I like to say is, if Scrivener and Google Docs and Vellum got together and had a baby, its name would be Atticus. And the reason for this is that my goal isn't just to create a formatting software. Uh, my goal is to create what I honestly believe will be the best book writing software. And that's because we hope to tackle uh, the entire process that an author would use from outlining, writing, collaborating with editors or other writers and formatting their book. And this way, authors don't have to jump from point to point to point. They don't have to use one software over here and then a software over here and then export to Word and then email back and forth with editors and, you know, and then buy another software to be able to format. And then by the end of it, they have maybe seven, eight, nine different Word docs on their desktop that say final version. Yeah. And let's face it. I mean, every, every author has had that moment of like, uh oh, which one is the final? Is it the one called final, final, or this is the final or final, please submit this one. Like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> if yeah. you go on my desktop, I always have to scratch my head about, wait, which one was the one that I actually used to format and then send to Amazon. And so we're right now at, when this comes out, we will have tackled the writing component and the formatting component and in quick succession. And anybody who's ever invested in rocket knows that I'm all about free updates and new features constantly. Uh, we have a lot of incredible features like goal planning, analytics, uh, even some fun Easter eggs and some gamification for getting people to want to write. But we even have a lot of really cool custom features to uh, make our formatting stand out. And once we've completed that, we then want to move into collaboration. And this is a component where you could work with an editor side by side. You can work with another author side by side uh, seamlessly instead of, you know, having to send files back and forth or communicate or could start working on Google Docs, which, you know, is is good for collaboration, but not very good for handling uh, 100,000 plus words or any of the other features that authors like to use. And so that is what Atticus is and will be. Yeah. So I'm really interested in the collaboration side of things. So I think I think we are I sort of understand what you're saying. We could get something that looks and feels like Scrivener but then moves on to formatting without moving out of the the software, which you sort of can do in Scrivener, but not many people use the formatting uh, element of Scrivener. It seems quite un I, I, to me anyway, it looks a bit unwieldy and feels that unwieldy. But to have something that you you hold your manuscript, there's one manuscript is is a very enticing prospect because I'm absolutely in tune with you once i love i like working working scrivener once it's out of scrivener it is kind of all over the place you know it gets emailed right. off it gets emailed back to you and then you immediately it's exactly as you've explained you're looking at initials at the end of it and looking at modified dates and so on so that's a big appeal to me so explain to me how that will work how there will still remain one version one entity that is your manuscript yeah. So we've designed the software from the beginning with this in mind. That's helped us to make a lot of decisions because, um, I mean, to be able to collaborate in the way that I'm about to explain, I mean, it really takes a lot under the hood to get there. Uh, so what would happen 
is that in the top you click, click collaboration and you have what we call four designations, okay? There's collaborate with another writer, editor, art team, and formatter, okay? And each one of those areas is a place where you, like it's kind of got its own limitation. So if you collaborate with another writer, clearly they can write. Uh, if you collaborate with an editor, they can only edit. Uh, art team can only read and leave comments and formatters can only touch the formatting. And that's, granted, we hope that our formatter is super easy, but maybe they want a skilled designer to create this amazing back image, you know, that totally fits their character or that particular page. Like you can just bring somebody in, they can make it happen. You look at it, you say, yep, I like it, click it, accept. And now it's imported as, as the final version inside your Atticus. Uh, and that's without having to leave. But let's go through each one, okay? So. Uh, if you want to collaborate with another author, okay, uh, on Atticus, that is one of those cases where the other author has to own Atticus as well. It's just, we don't think it's going to be a good experience if the person's using kind of a smaller version of it or something like that. So collaboration between two authors requires that they both have it. However, with editors though, we know that with editors, that's just not going to fly well. Maybe editors in time will do it. But what we know from editors is most enjoy how word is right using word and the track changes and all that so here's what it would look like as an author if you want to collaborate with an editor um, you select editor you put in their email address and it sends them a link and when they click it it will allow them to create a browser a free version of of atticus and in their web browser and they can create their account and they'll see your book right there they can click on it and then at that point, what it looks like is it looks exactly like Word. So they don't have to learn anything new. Uh, it's gonna, the buttons will be where they would expect it, the functionality. There's a couple of things we're gonna borrow from Google Docs that I think they do right to help with collaboration, but all in all, it's gonna feel like Word. And what's awesome for the author is that inside their Atticus, they can go to collaboration, they can look and they can actually see real time what's happening, kind of like Google Docs in that respect. They can see the, the editor, leave comments, make track changes. And what's even cooler is the author can accept them, they can comment back, they can communicate with the editor. And when they accept it, it will be immediately put in their manuscript and uh, it will then be there. So unless you accept it or not, it won't show up in your manuscript. So it's kind of like a safe mode, okay? That you can work with your editor and the moment you accept it, it's applied. And so now you can go back and forth. and. When you're done, here's my favorite part about it, is that when you're done, whether it's art team or editor or you know formatter, you can literally click one, you can see everybody you've given permission to, and you can click one button and it cuts their connection to it. So when you're done with the editor, you don't have to worry about the editor still having access to your book. You don't have to worry about the art team still having access to um, your, you know, the art team having access to uh, your files. And we're also gonna make it very, uh, secure so that people can't download it. So there's not going to be another copy floating around out there or it gets out to pirates. So to kind of recap on this, it's a safe mode for you to be able to give people access with certain permissions. You can work with them inside of your Atticus. And then when you're done and they no longer need access, you can securely uh, remove them from it. And now you can look at one screen and know everybody who has access to it or nobody has access to it but you wow and that's 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 what i'm most excited about because yeah. you start throwing out a copy out there and you don't know who has it well not yeah. anymore and do you see the editor's updates live i mean if they they go through page one and make a change and then they're on page two can you be on page one looking at reviewing what they've done exactly yes you can and what's really cool from the editor's perspective is is that they can mark when a chapter is ready for you to to review it so now you can see when they're ready for you okay maybe they they like to go down the chapter first and then you know then they come back through it again or they want to kind of think and hum and haw about some component uh well until they do this one particular move that then therefore marks that this chapter is ready for you um like you can see where they're at and you can also see what they've done and you can accept them you can go along with them or not um and so that really makes it easy the other thing too is that we'll have a counter at the top that lets you know how many changes they've made that you have either ex uh, that you haven't accepted yet and how many comments that you have acknowledged so there's no chance 
that you could think that you were done and forget that there was one track change where they removed a comma somewhere and you just didn't see it. And then you go to publish your book with that comma that shouldn't be there. Uh, this is just one more, shall we say, extra part that should help backup authors uh, in that collaboration component. Wow. So they could, they could if they wanted to work more traditionally and think I I'm going to do a pass on this book, but I don't want them to see my edits until I've gone back and reviewed it all myself. And then I'll hand them all over in one go. If they wanted to, they could do that, the editor. They don't, they're not forced to reveal every edit instantly. They could do it at the end. Yeah, that's true. And that can be a preference or a discussion point that you have. One of the things that I really like, especially with um, collaborating with authors, is that when you go to give somebody collaboration component, you can actually decide what permissions or what things they can and can't do inside of that. Um, you know, so for example, uh, maybe it's a situation where it, it's, you know, let's say we, we all know that one part where there's the the really awesome writer. And then there's the other writer that's maybe the name isn't so, so much known. And maybe there's a different set of permissions between the two. You know, you don't want maybe author B to override author A. Well, if you're the one setting out the permission, you can set those kind of things up. So it gives you that kind of capability. Same thing with beta readers too. I haven't discussed them, but like if you have your beta readers or your uh, street team or whatever you call them, depending on whether it's before or after you've written, um, you can sign, you can send them all a copy. They can read it uh, on their browsers and they can leave comments and you can change the permission to state whether or not they can see other beta readers comments or only their own, you know? So it's like these little things to kind of give authors options. Because like, for example, if you have beta readers, you might have that maybe one beta reader leaves a comment and then all of a sudden that starts a cascade of them all jumping on the same thing, even though the others wouldn't have even thought of it until they saw it. So some authors prefer beta readers not to see other beta readers comments um, and instead just kind of have their own level. And so, again, we want to create these options for authors. This is pretty groundbreaking. I mean, the idea of, of the end of that waiting for edits to come back period but yeah. it becomes more of a flowing process um, is one just one small aspect that could you know change the kind of ecosystem in which writers exist, which I think is really exciting. Um, yeah, exactly. As somebody who's been who's used Scrivener way back in like 2007, um, <laughs> it's always been my own personal pain point yeah. of having to jump from program to program, from file to file. And I've just kind of always wished there was something that could do this. So. Yeah, and it did annoy me the first time an editor said, um, I want it in Word, double-spaced in 12-point and stuff. I thought, well, can't I just hand the Scrivener file over to you? Oh, I don't do Scrivener. <laughs> but that's how they are. And that, of course, does bring me on to that, that point about, you know, they are quite conservative with a, a small C, the editing and writing community. They'll have to do some adaptation here. That's obviously what you've had in mind to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. But personally, I would love the love the time where... An editor is, is Atticus accredited type thing. So you, before you even talk to them and get a quote, you see, yes, they work on Atticus. So that yeah, I, I wonder think that will become a self-fulfilling thing because editors will realize they've got to be on there. Oh, for sure. And well, you know, one of the things that I, I really look forward to doing is, is that we will be having a branch of the company that will be looking for editors that want to go through training. And then on top of that, we at Atticus can also recommend editors that would accept Atticus for sure, know how to use it, um, you know, and so that way, if you're not sure which editor you want, you can go and find a list of editors that are very qualified, that are capable of using the program and are willing to do it, um, especially as we get started, because a lot of editors may balk at it at first because it's not what they're used to. But I really believe that the ones that give it a try will be very familiar with it from the get go, because we are we understand that you know, Word is the preferred uh, situation. We're going to be working with editors as beta users as well to make sure that we really get uh, the kind of features that not only they're used to, but the ones they've always wanted. And so we can get that implemented. I really believe that that in time, we'll be able to uh, show editors that this is a much better process for them. And I think as more people jump on, it will become kind of the norm. So. Yeah. And where are you with the uh, the software at the moment? What features are going to be live when it releases? Yeah. So we will have basically the formatting at almost the level of Vellum and we'll be quickly adding more features. I, I believe that will surpass them um, 
and we'll have the writing component as well. Uh, we have a lot of things that I want to add to writing, especially as we gear up for uh, NaNoWriMo. Um, you know, I we want to show we want to have analytics. So, like for example, one of the things I would love to see um, and that we have designed out is, and this will be the first I ever announced this, but uh, we're going to have some fun games. Like for example, if you type in the word "the end" and you don't type anything after that for a bit. Uh, all of a sudden, a little fireworks will go off because, you know, congratulations, you just finished your book. Uh, we'll also have a pop up that has analytics that shows uh, not only how many words, but how much time you spent inside the project itself and working. I mean, that's to me, it would be really cool to kind of show that, wow, this is how many hours or days that I spent writing and, and building this from the beginning. Um, so we have things like that. We also have like goal setting. So uh, you know, timers, um, specific zone settings to make it very clear when you're in the writing zone. Um, and, and there's a lot of really cool components that will help authors to meet their writing goals every day, kind of help gamify it a bit. Uh, we're looking at giving badges and kind of like marks. So like when you've written a total amount of words, you get this badge or this rank, or when you have hit your daily goal every day, you get a badge. Kind of borrowing from the ideas of Fitbit a little bit on that. Um, so those are some of the areas we want to really focus in. I also, one of the things that I love most about what we're doing is, is that I want to work with as many companies as possible. Okay. Uh, we want to make sure that we work extremely well with pro writing aid. Grammarly is going to be a bit hard. Um, and, you know, for anybody who's tried to use them inside of like other programs, they're I hope maybe they'll come around, but uh, they can really drag down a lot of um, like Google Docs. They kind of drag down a bit. There's a couple of other areas, but we're working with like for the words plotter. I would love for people who love plotter to be able to export and then just import it right into Atticus. And it takes the information and puts it in the right spot so you can use it while you write. Um, we're gung ho about making sure to add as many integrations with the tools because there's things about authors we're all different. We all have preferences on how we do it. I'm not going to be able to perfect outlining. Just, I'm going to say it for everybody, right? We'll create our own way, but we want to make sure that, Hey, if you love plotter, if you love, you know, uh, outliner, if you love, you know, list all the other companies that will be able to over time, be able to take anything you work in there and help to apply the right information in the right spot. So you can get more out of it. Uh, same thing kind of goes with, um, you know, are, you know, editors, we're not the masters of editors, providing aid is much better, you know, and if you love what they do, great. Uh, for the words is a fun, a super fun gamification of writing. And so we want to make sure that if you're writing inside of Atticus, that it's applied to your game. Um, and so one big thing is we're going to be focusing on integration. And we have a whole bunch of other like new features to formatting that I that I like to see uh, that will probably be coming out in the first couple of weeks from launch. But once we've hit those marks, that's the moment where my team is going to be really focusing in on the collaboration. I can't say exactly what date I've learned in programming that that's like the worst thing is to ever give yourself like a particular date. Um, but we have a all star team of programmers. Um, that I'm just really jazzed about. And we're going to be working full time uh, all the way through to make sure that that collaboration not only uh, comes out, but it comes out and it improves over and over again. Wow. And are you working? I think you were working with a team in the Far East for Kindlepreneur. Are you, are you working with the same guys here? Yeah, actually. So uh, this is like a little bit of inside information on it. But, um, you know, with, with Publisher Rocket, we had a great uh, bunch of programmers, but what I learned was, was that I needed access to even more talent to be able to build out Atticus. I mean, this is, this is uh, a serious piece of software, like beyond. Um, and so what I did was I bought a one third stake in a software development company, and I've been working uh, extensively within that company to build its capability to hire some of the best programmers possible. And, um, you know, we have, we, uh, and that's allowed me to, get this team together. Um, and so that's, that's been excellent. It's um, we also have a phenomenal support team. Anybody who's ever worked with uh, rocket support <laughs> knows exactly what I mean about that. But I also believe that support is kind of a window into the heart of a company, you know, and if you're not uh, providing something to really help in that component, then what are you doing? Um, so yeah, so it, it's it's an eclectic group. Most of my support team is here in the United States and Canada, um, but yeah, it's been it's been fun. And how much would it cost? 
So when it comes out, it will be 147. And that's a one-time fee. Uh, that's and that's for books and ebooks, unlimited books and ebooks, uh, which at this time is half the cost of what Vellum is. And uh, I'm not a fan of subscriptions, as many people know. Uh, the reason for that, especially for writing, is that I don't like as an author, I just don't like the idea of having to pay each month in order to use the platform in which I store all my writing on. Like that just kind of feels off to me. Um, and then on top of that, even if, even if the company say, well, you know, if you stop paying us, we'll allow you to download your content. Okay, cool. But in order to do the whole process of writing a book, like I don't want to spend all this time learning something and getting experience in something to only have to then keep paying just so I can potentially use it. Uh, and then the moment I stop paying, am I going to something else? Like, so we really wanted to create a, a platform where authors can just know that they're here, that this is what they use, not have to learn something else, uh, not have to learn four different softwares, but just the one. And uh, we figured that doing that was a much better model. Just on that question about um, you know having your your manuscript in there in in one version, so going back a little bit, what security is there for the manuscript, and what do you have version history, for instance, and is it offloaded somewhere outside of your servers in case things go wrong? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So what we do is that we we store it on our servers, which are AWS. Uh, we have a super hardcore encryption on that. Um, and our team, uh, we do not go through that. We do not touch those things at all. That is your work. And that is very clear that that is your work. On top of that, though, you can also save it locally. Um, so you can do both. The key is, is that um, you can tell Atticus to save onto your computer as well. The only way, the reason why we have to store it and kind of have that back up on the server is because, well, we're doing the collaboration thing. If we weren't doing this collaboration thing at all, like then, yeah, we would have, you know, I'd have been like, Hey, let's just make it a, you know, just a downloadable software that doesn't tap in. Um, but in order to collaborate and coordinate, that was a big part. Uh, what's awesome though about this is you can work offline as well. The only time that you need to be connected to the internet uh, with Atticus is when you upload a manuscript. Okay. So you have a word document that you want to upload. Uh, if you want to collaborate with somebody <laughs> when that comes out, like clearly, uh, and also when you want to export your final file, that's it. Everything else can be done offline. And, um, we have a couple of things that we're going to be adding over time. Like, for example, you said the version history, uh, that's really key. We have already started where we can send you version history. So in case you did something crazy, like, we have had a couple of people who deleted their book. <laughs> like, like they, they thought they were deleting something else and they deleted the wrong book. We took care of it, said, nope, no problem. We got it for you. Here you go. And phew, there it is. Um, but we're going to make something very soon where authors can choose which version they want. They can even mark off, like if they want to go in a different direction on a chapter and then come back, you know, um, they can mark it inside of Atticus and then they can revert back to it if they want. So those are things that are coming. Uh, but right now we have the ability to save locally and we have the ability, we do have the ability for uh, previous versions or history, but we're going to soon make it where you can control that. Yeah. Wow. What a big project this has been. I remember when you first mentioned it some time ago and you've been through, I imagine, a gestation period that's always challenging for any kind of big thing that's gonna <laughs> gonna do this uh, do this much. How are you feeling about it now? Are you feeling confident this is uh, this is going to be where you want it to be in a couple of years' time? Oh yeah. Um, so when we we did a private launch of this, I think back in June, and boy, we fell on our faces. Like I'm not even going to hide that. Um, we we did not realize how many people were going to jump on it and jump on it as quick. And it literally broke our system. Uh, we, and then on top of that too, um, we had a lot of problems on the inside that we needed to fix. And luckily a lot of people really just kind of believed in what we were doing. So mad props and, and mad thanks. Anybody listening who was a part of that, uh, we super appreciate it. And uh, we have been spending so many months working with individual authors, getting real use case um, and being able to apply and learn from that. So if it wasn't for all of those people that were there from the beginning, 
Um, you know, this would be scary, but we've really been in operational mode uh, for a while. We're just adding more. We're getting feedback. I'm doing uh, an AMA session with the beta users and we're just, you know, having a lot of fun with it. So I'm really excited about where we're at and where we're going to be when, especially when this comes out. Um, and it, it's because of the, those, shall we say, fun uh um, complications and challenges that we had from the get-go, but we're so much stronger because of it. And a mad appreciation to everybody who was a part of that. Yeah. Move fast and break things, I think is what Mark Zuckerberg said when they were setting <laughs> up Facebook. And I guess that must feel a bit like that at the moment. Well, uh, we wish you luck with it, Dave. And um, yeah, I'll definitely be one of your your launch customers there and I'll be giving it a go. So um, I'm definitely, I'm a big, you know, I'm a Scrivener, Vellum, fan and i'm not a big fan of exporting to word and sending it off but i know that's what editors insist on at the moment so that will be the big thing for me in in time to come um so your old company which is still very relevant and used every day by many of us publisher rocket uh, i know is still a, an evolving and changing thing i saw your qr codes uh, stuff today drop on on an email <laughs> that you can generate those for authors now um you know publisher rocket i guess is not standing still through all of this no, no. In fact, I'll tell you um, what, let me not jump ahead. We better explain what Publisher Rocket is for people listening who may may not be aware. Yeah, my first ever foray into real software was Publisher Rocket years ago. Um, and what it was, was a book marketing tool. Uh, it was to help authors find the right keywords, to discover the right categories, improve their effective and efficiency in Amazon ads. Um, but when I first launched it, all it did was keywords and competition analysis. That was it. Uh, if you saw what it looked like when we first came out to what it looks like today, um, <laughs> it's a far cry. And that's the thing is, is that once it came out, uh, it was all about how do I improve it, make it better, make it more accurate, increase it to more markets. Um, you know, and we're always tinkering and tweaking. And of course, you also have Amazon who changes things all the time. Uh, so it's it's kept me and my team on our toes. Uh, we just came out with a brand new improvement to the keyword feature where we now give uh, red light, green light, and yellow light to give you kind of an indication if that's a good keyword or not. And it goes beyond just a static number. Uh, one thing that, uh, that authors have really liked about it is that you may have a keyword phrase and it has a large search number, right? The number of people who search that term. But then you might see, and that might be like a yellow, okay? Then you see another term that has less searches, but it's green. And that's because over the years we've been like analyzing Amazon and we found that there are certain keywords that while they get typed more, they actually don't sell as many books as other keywords. And so we've implemented that into the system to make it even smarter and better for authors. Uh, case in point, like if somebody goes to Amazon and they type in the word fantasy book, right? Sure, there are a lot of searches for that. But what are the chances that Amazon's going to present the perfect kind of fantasy? Right. And so what ends up happening is a lot of shoppers go to Amazon, they type in fantasy book, they see the list and like, Meh, OK, um, what can I add to my phrase to make it more clear what I'm looking for? And they might say like elf epic war. And then they look and they're like, OK, well, there's way too many scantily clothed uh, people on the covers. And so then they'll say, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, or something. they'll add something until they finally get to what they're looking for. And so we started to see that there's higher conversion rates on longer phrases and certain phrases than there are the broad phrases. And so we've implemented that in the system to just make it so much more accurate and to help guide authors so they can make better choices um, without having to be the, the number nerds that we are. So we did that. Um, and very soon we're going to be having a new feature come out, uh, which is Audible. So you'll be able to uh, learn about Audible books, um, how much money Audible books are making. Uh, so you'll see those. You can do competition analysis there. And also it will include all of the Audible categories. So we'll have the entire catalog of every category and you'll know how many audible sales you need to make in order to be the bestseller or how to rank in those. Um, and that's all coming out very soon. And we have a new feature after that, that I've been working on for over a year and a half. Um, and that's historical category data. So there's over 14,000 Amazon us categories, uh, in book and ebook. And we currently have them all listed and a great way to kind of help you find these categories. Uh, and they tell you how many books you need to sell that day in order to be number one. But now what you can do is, well, 
when this feature comes out, when you click on that particular category, you'll be able to see the sales trends over the year for that category. And what's really awesome about this is that you'll be able to see how many competitors have been added, you know, how hard is this, how much money it's been making, is it trending up, is it trending down? And even more so, my favorite is, is there some place in the year where there's a dip and a spike so that maybe planning your book launch can be even better? And that's going to be 100% free for anybody who owns it. Uh, that's just a free new feature that we're adding because personally, that's something I've wanted to see. Yeah. So uh, that's just how we operate. I do find the categories astonishing. 14,000, you say, in the US. Yeah, and, and in yeah, the US get, When you upload your book on the KDP bookshelf, you get access, well, you, you can only choose two and you get access to, I don't know how many is in that list, 120 or something, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, so the list that, that uh, when you go to publish your book on Amazon and KDP and they ask you to select your categories, uh, that pop-up is that pop-up box that has a list. Those are actually BISACs. So those aren't even Amazon categories. Um, and BISACs are this international standard code. Of, it's kind of like a, a catalog, if you will, where all the publishers in the world kind of like said, okay, these are the accepted categories that we all acknowledge. Um, and so when you choose a BISAC, that's like a, it's a number that's sort of like sent to the companies so that they know where to put the book. Uh, the reason for this is say, you know, a mom and pa shop may only have like six aisles, right? And all of a sudden they get a book called like Wiccan Wars, okay? That person who opens up the box may think, oh, Wiccan, okay, maybe that's um, religious studies or maybe that's fantasy or maybe that's, and so they don't know. So they created this code of, they look at the code and then they look at their catalog and they're like, oh, okay, that goes on aisle six. You know, they, there's no subjective opinion. That's why they created the BISAC system. Uh, so when you go to publish your book on Amazon, there's there's less than 5,000 BISAC codes. And so you select two and then Amazon takes that and they'll put you in what they think is the equivalent Amazon category. Now, most of the time it's the same. Sometimes though, that category, uh, it could be something different. Um, and so people will sometimes check the categories their book is actually listed for and be like, that's not what I asked for. Um, and remember, there's less than 5,000 BISACs. There's 14,000 Amazon categories. Um, and so there are a lot of categories out there that authors don't even know that they can select because they just think the BISAC system is the only way. Um, so just having that catalog has been really big for people. Uh, but then to really look and see what's trending and learn, or if maybe they're kind of curious about where they should write, I think this historical category data is really going to help them out. Yeah. So how out of interest, I know that you introduced me uh, and many other people to the fact that you can email uh, Amazon and get your book put into more categories. Is that up to 10, I think, something like that. But without, yep. without that knowledge, and that's probably only the, the, again, we always say there's lots of people publishing indie books and then a small number listening to these podcasts and actively thinking about it and doing this sort of thing. That's only a few of us doing that. So without us intervening, how does Amazon put your book into any of those other non bisac equivalent 14,000 categories? So there's a couple of things. First off is, is that they'll translate the bisac you chose into what they might think. Yeah. Uh, another thing too is, is that, um, and they're not, they're not very motivated to do it. It's not like they do it often, um, but they will analyze what they think your book is about. And sometimes, sometimes is a keyword. Uh, they will put you in another category to, that they think, but they don't do that often. So most of the time books will maybe only be a part of like two or three categories total. Um, and it's not like Amazon's like, oh, let's put this book part of like five, six, seven, eight. Um, instead though, Amazon so they went from where you had to send an email, but now they have a special form just for requesting the addition of categories, the changing of categories, and also even categories in different markets. So you can email them to make sure you're in certain categories for the UK, for Germany, and so forth. Um, they've now optimized the process. Technically, uh, there is no maximum number on categories. It's weird. They, to this day, or that I know of, they have not yet said that there is a certain number. I always say the rule of thumb is 10 because you always have to deal with the humans. And I love to call them the Amazon humans. Um, anybody who's ever dealt with the Amazon humans, they know exactly what I mean when I say it, like I say it. Um, but sometimes you just get a human that's like, you know, you fill out the form for adding categories and the human will respond back and say, I'm sorry, but you can't request categories. It's like, I just sent the form that says change yeah. your category. Like, you know, so sometimes you just get that human. I found that with 10 categories, you'd almost never get any pushback. 
and that's 10 total. Um, sometimes beyond 10, uh, it depends on the human you get. Sometimes they're like, yeah, sure. No problem. Uh, you know, and sometimes they're like, no, we don't, we don't do that at all. You know? So, so the key is, is that I say is tens, tens, the tens, the, the usual limit, is, we'll is a good way. number. Um, yep. that, that's interesting. So there is a little bit of perhaps almost, oh, well, I, th I think you'll probably, you will know this. I'm sure there's a little bit of AI work going on in Amazon that try and pick out what a book's about and place it in some other categories. And the reason I say that is because we often give this example of um, somebody who got number one in an obscure category and it wasn't mm. really related to their book. And there's a little bit of, whether it's mischief or just a bit of fun, I don't know, but it was like a romance book and the naked torso man had a chisel and it was like number one in woodworking. Yeah, um, masonry. But, yeah, <laughs> and, but do you know what? It might not have been the author's fault because I saw something popped up on Twitter and I'll send this picture to John our editor, so you can put it on screen now as we're talking about it. But someone noticed there's a UK comedian uh, called Bob Mortimer, a slightly um, uh, anarchic, brilliant uh, comedian. He's written his autobiography. The front cover picture of, his, of him like screaming, and somebody noticed his book is number one in opera singer biographies. <laughs> And I, I wonder whether some level of AI and Amazon saw the image of him, which does probably have a lot in common with an opera singer. This man with his mouth wide open on, on screen and automatically put it into one of those categories, thinking it might help itself. I would doubt that. Um, first off and foremost, you know, with AI or the, the algorithms, it's really hard to get the context of a picture. Um, you know, especially when you're working like SEO with Google, I always tell people Google has no idea what that picture really is. It can't really, it's super, super hard for a calculation to figure out that that's a picture of a dog, a, a green dog doing a trick for food or something like that. Right. So that's why we have to put alt tags in there to help Google understand what the picture is of. So for it to potentially have seen that, um, that would be a lot of hardcore crunching on their part. And I personally just don't think Amazon really cares about the category system because there are a lot of really like, there's a lot of authors that will put their books into things that clearly they are not a part of. Um, and there has been no retribution, uh, no, no issue. Like, I just don't think Amazon has the motivation to do the heavy lifting of figuring out what categories of books should be. It would be a lot of, of humans that would probably have to be involved. And that just probably isn't a good use of their resources. So um, let me sad just, as it sounds, I just don't think they uh, do that. My wonderful theory, but this is a traditionally published book. So it seems also seems unlikely to me that someone at this publishers would have requested it go into opera singer biographies, but maybe they did. But what I'm curious about then, so you get your 5,000 bisacks, 14,000 other categories. So the other, what is that? Um, 9,000 categories were only there for those of us who contacted Amazon and said, can you put me into that category? There's no other way your book would find its way into those. No, like I said, I think there are a couple of categories that that you may naturally be uh, added to, but I just don't see it happening a lot. I don't oh. see books ask for two and then be a part of 10, no. um, you know, naturally. I, I think that it does happen once or twice. Now, about a year ago, or maybe even two years ago, there used to be the thing where Amazon, and then before that, uh, there used to be a thing where if you wanted to be a part of a certain category, you had to use a certain keyword. And they literally had a page that listed all of these categories that required a certain keyword in order to get put into that. However, though, a year ago, Amazon not only destroyed that page, they got rid of it. Um, there's no indication that there is a trigger. So what this tells me is, is that I do think that Amazon still kind of looks at the keywords to kind of help maybe um, automatically put you into something. So like, for example, you might not have select authorian, but if you use authorian as a keyword, then they may like, that's kind of a trigger for them to do it. They're just no longer promoting that um, since they now have the form where authors can just request whatever they want. So I think that there's probably a calculation in there I don't think that they're putting a lot of resources into expanding upon it because they're clearly not culling uh, the, the thing. And at one point they were using keywords to help them figure it out. Now they just don't promote it. So I think they've now kind of sat back and said, hey, maybe we'll do this a little bit, um, but we'll just rely on the authors to tell us. And I don't think they're going to lift a finger to try to subjectively figure out if that was a good category they requested or not. Yeah. Well, it's people kind of a sad state. I think few people outside of Amazon know more about it than you do. And you know a lot more than a lot of the people inside Amazon, uh, particularly some, one or two of those people we email. <laughs>
it's been fun uh, looking under the hood, um, yeah. working with the programs, staying on my toes, analyzing. Uh, we've also done a bunch of experiments too. We once created like a, a special crawler to try to like index. Um, that was expensive as all be because Amazon does not like being crawled. No. Um, but to help us kind of figure out things like how to best prepare your seven Kindle keywords. Um, so I, I constantly tell people, I, I really love the fact that I've got a programming team that really helps me kind of get into the weeds and uh, so combining that with being an author is just a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, Dave, what an absolute pleasure has been catching up with you. Um, like I say, I said at the beginning, so sorry, it won't be in person. Well, certainly not this month, maybe November, but who knows? We'll keep Let's fingers hope. crossed for that. You better let people know where they can find Atticus. Yeah, you can find Atticus at atticus.io. Um, and if anybody has any questions about anything we talked about or so, you can always hit me up at kindlepreneur.com. I've got a contact form there and I'm Still responding to each and every one of them. Excellent. Did you catch those fly balls behind you? Or dirty ones? Are they from a game? Oh, no. Um, I'm a avid uh, baseball person. I love historic baseball. Um, and so the center ball is the 1953 Red Sox team sign ball with Ted Williams front and center. The one on the left is Mickey Mantle, and the one on the right is Joe DiMaggio. Wow. Uh, and so, and then the one all the way on the right is a um, the white ball, the, 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 the clean, clean one. one. Yeah, is a uh, one word stenciled picture of my dad, myself, and my son Kean at the Fenway game watching the Red Sox versus Yankees. And I took my dad there before he died of cancer. And so it's kind of a um, it's kind of a kind of a memorial yeah, uh, to awesome. him and just that that really amazing experience of the three generations being able to watch the Red Sox uh, well, together. And then and my dad was a diehard Red Sox fan and he had never been to Fenway. Wow. So to do that the way we did, it was just, it was perfect. That's very cool and very lovely. What a great thing that uh, sport does for us to uh, have those memories. Dave, such a pleasure talking to you. One of the great guys in, uh, in indie publishing and uh, we're very happy to be your friend here, at SPF and a friend of Kindle Purnell. We will catch up properly, I'm sure, in person at some point. Uh, but until then, just wish you all the very best with the Atticus big release. Hey, and thank you so much for having me. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. I mean, it's, a, it's audacious. I think Atticus, it's audacious. And I love the idea of having a single place to be to write and format and edit because I did, I was a little bit shocked when you would know this because you're old hand at this, but when I had my book in Scrivener, you can export it um, or you could hand over the Scrivener file, but then the editor says, no, this is how we edit. We want a Word document and it double space. I want it in Times New Roman and 12 pointing. Oh, okay. Um, so you have to export it there and suddenly that's your book. It's not the one in Scrivener anymore. That's an old, out-of-date version because the first change that happens in that Word document means that's the new version of it. So you make those changes. And then at some point, you upload it to a formatting uh, bit of software. I use Vellum. And as soon as you make your first change there, the Word document's out of date. Um, and so keeping an eye on which is the actual version of your book has is something you really do need to pay attention to. And I'm sure I'm not the first author to suddenly stare at a folder on a computer thinking, well, which, which one is it? Try uh, 50 books. Yeah, well, I can only imagine. Uh, I'm it's, getting a little it, bit like you, that with Fuse, of course. But yeah. You do have to be um, yeah, fairly religious about things like naming conventions and making sure that you know you understand you know if you have a final file it needs to be marked final and then not opened and you know and tinkered around with or, or make sure you're not doing that to the wrong one it, it is yeah it's not ideal um i, I don't actually mind I, I quite like when you go out of scrivener and into word so i've, re I've recently done that with uh, the new milton book it's it's a nice step on the road because you know that once i'm in word um i'm into kind of tinkering and tweaking mode rather than Scrivener, which is more about the drafting and the organization. It's kind of for yeah. the bigger jobs. When you get into, when you're at the stage where you can go into Word, for me anyway, that that's, that's um, I'm polishing at that point. Um, and Word's quite good for that. The track changes is really, is, is excellent. It's been refined over 20 years, so it works very well. Um, so it's, and that's something that Scrivener does not do well. Um, so, yeah. you know, good luck to, good luck to um, Atticus. Um, that is a, uh, that he's bitten off a lot that's yeah. going to be it's quite ambitious and i've seen others try that before in the community i know james not sorry james i'm uh, johnny I'm james. And, and, and sean platt and david wright had a had a similar product a writing product that, that they couldn't get to work 
Um, so it's it's challenging. Um, but, you know, if anyone can do it, I think Dave has a, has a pretty good chance. So best of luck to him. Yeah, he has a software background and obviously Publisher Rocket is a quite compl- it is a complex bit of software. He's a nuclear works- submarine background as well. But that's, yeah, uh- yeah, it was a boom on the boomers, isn't he? Um, <laughs> Doesn't doesn't do that anymore. Uh, yeah, so we will watch with interest. I will um, sign up. I think I've already signed up, and um, I don't think I don't know if I was in the beta or not, but I, I will certainly sign up to buy Atticus and uh, support Dave and uh, and give it a go. Yeah, I do like that idea of being in one place and, and the editor going backwards and forwards. Of course, editors I think are people generally I imagine who have worked in the same way for some time or will will continue to want to work in that way. Um, so getting them out of Word and onto Atticus will be a massive. Uh, Mm. massive thing but what will happen hopefully if few people do it is that on Reedsy and stuff when people are trying to recruit editors they'll say are you Atticus certified basically and if the answer is no they might go to an editor who is and that's the sort of thing that will start to shift potentially editors in the future anyway uh, good luck to Dave Chesson. Right, that's it. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's uh, Friday, so you can have the rest of the day off if you like um, and have a beer. Um, I'm going to do the Cricket Club Junior Presentation Awards barbecue tonight. It's my job as chairman of the Cricket Club doing the barbie. I might go and buy a three wood this afternoon, though, just to cheer myself up. And I have got a new shiny iPhone because I'm shallow and I do require shiny things to fill Mm -hmm. the void in my soul. Me too. Yeah, mine's on its way. So uh, I've got a nice new one going to every year, which is ridiculous, I know. But, you know, I love um, tech. I'm every two years because I care more about the environment and the random penguins <laughs> than, than you yes. do. Yes, random penguins. <laughs> uh, name of our grunge band. Good. Thank you very much indeed. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.